we are, we're in the week three, we uh, did the introduction, uh, we did chapter one, and so today we get into chapter two. And like I said, I think we can get a little over halfway done through the book, you know, before Advent and Christmas, and then January uh, finish up, if we go about a chapter a week, like I said. It, and it, I'm uh, uh, much less uh, rigid in my timeline, I'm open to your questions and your comments uh, as we move along. Uh, I think that's a, a big part of growing in our faith and understanding of God's Word, is uh, when we gather together like this, uh, God's people gathered around God's Word, and how do, how do these verses speak to you? How does this, uh, you know, inform thoughts or decisions you're about to make? How does this reflect upon experiences you've had in your life? And I think as we share those uh, amongst each other, brothers and sisters, uh, it strengthens all of us. So I don't want to uh, stand up here and lecture like it's a, some kind of college class, uh, but I'm certainly happy to facilitate. All right. Uh, first Corinthians, we are in uh, <clears throat> the first large section here. Remember, uh, essentially, Paul wrote five essays in this first epistle to the Corinthians. The first one is mainly about division, division within the church of Corinth. Uh, Pastor Jeremy last week got into uh, chapter 1, the very specific problems uh, that they were having and how Paul was addressing that with the gospel. Paul continues to uh, address that with the gospel today. And this first little section actually overlaps uh, between the end of chapter 1 and beginning of chapter 2. Uh, but the main theme is the, the power and the wisdom of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, and that's what Paul is going to emphasized and repeatedly say to us over and over again, you're going to hear the word wisdom, I don't know, I didn't count, many, multiple dozen times, uh, just in this one chapter, chapter two. Uh, it, it's a big theme, and you can understand, again, he's speaking uh, uh, to uh, Corinth, Greece, right, and 2,000 years ago, this is uh, home of Athens, and philosophy and Aristotle and Plato, wisdom. They, they loved eloquent speakers. They loved, they would even hire uh, people who were eloquent to teach them how to speak more eloquently. Uh, the, the pursuit of wisdom was almost the, is the highest ideal in their society. And so Paul uh, very uh, correctly will uh, point out the, the difference between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. Uh, there's a big difference. But that's why he references that all the time. So in the first, uh, first five verses here, verse 1, if you got your Bibles open, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, you know, Pastor Jeremy told me not to put any Bible verses on the screen, not to make it easy on you. He said, you guys, if it's a Bible study, you need to get in your Bibles. That's what it is. Study your Bibles. All right, so get familiar with uh, where 1 Corinthians is, it's right after Romans, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. There you're going to find it. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And Paul writes, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. Wait, and so what was with Paul? Well, you got to go back to the end of chapter 1. He talks about those who, let those who boast, boast in the Lord. Remember, Pastor Jeremy covered that last week. What does it mean to boast in the Lord? Yes, no, you don't remember, that's fine. Uh, so Paul continues, just as, you know, we boast in the Lord, that's what Paul's saying, when I came to you, so it was with me, brothers and sisters, I boasted in the Lord. When I came to you, I did not come, here it is, with eloquent or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. And there he's addressing, their, their itching ears for for masterfully crafted uh, rhetorical arguments, uh, for philosophical wisdom to be uh, uh, transmitted to them in, in great oratory. Uh, Paul was not a eloquent, uh, dynamic public speaker. Uh, he came humbly. He came with just the truth of the gospel came with the foundation of, of God's word. And that's what he proclaimed, and that's what he stood on. So in verse 2, 
For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now again, remember, their incredible virtue, their value that they place on obtaining wisdom, the wisdom of this world, science and the great philosophies. And Paul's saying, I didn't, I didn't try to know any of that stuff. I'm not, even, I'm not even concerned about that, except I know Jesus Christ. I know he was crucified for the sins of the world, and I know that he rose from the dead. It's a testimony that he is the true God who loves this world and makes a way for us, all people, all sinners, to be right with him again, to live eternally with him. Does anybody see any parallel in our culture today? Do you see anybody who worship science? Who, who think of the wisdom of the world as the highest a thing to attain? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, uh, one of the, I've got, I've got a copy of this book in my office. I've got a copy of the book at home. Uh, one here is to loan out. So if you want this, uh, the title is, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. <laughs> and it's so great. It's so great. Uh, they walk around as if they are completely objective in their worldview as they declare, you know, these things that they have uh, discovered. Um, the, the fact is, science uh, comes with many assumptions. Uh, there are many assumptions. I, we, well, I could, I, honestly, I, I'll try not to spend the whole time on this, but, but I just have to say a few words, because it is kind of a hot uh, soapbox uh, for me. Um, I have a bachelor's of science, okay? I don't claim to be, I don't claim to be some MIT physicist, PhD, no. But I have a bachelor's of science in mathematics, and I know the scientific method. I understand the empirical method. Um, there are assumptions, always, uh, when, we, uh, when we do science. Um, the assumptions that have to be made for evolution to be believed in are uh, far more uh, out there, uh, far more problematic statistically. Uh, than just saying there's a creator, there's a, there's a designer in this finely tuned universe uh, that sustains carbon-based life like nowhere else in the universe. Um, it's, it's amazing to me that uh, the, the scientists will, they will start with uh, their assumptions and their first assumption is that there, there is no God. Right? Let's get rid of God. Let's get rid of the Bible. Okay, now, let's look at the universe. Let's look at astronomy. Okay, let's look at biology. Let's look at the origin of life. Let's look at the development of species. How did it all happen? How can we explain all of this? Well, surprise, surprise, when they start without God, they end with a theory that does not include God. Well, duh. Don't tell me there aren't any assumptions. If you say, well, maybe there's a God, just give a maybe to it, well, that changes everything. That changes the probability and the statistics of how everything comes together and exists and evolves and sustained. Um, anyway, I could really talk for a long time. Maybe I'll do a whole, whole class on that someday. But this is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, these, these seekers of philosophical Wisdom. He goes, no, I don't need to know any of that stuff. All I need to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. He goes, God, and this is what God does for those he loves. He gives himself. Verse 3, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. That reminds me about 14 years ago when I preached my very first sermon. Great fear and trembling. You know, you know why pastors wear the robes? So you can't see our knees shaking when we're up there. <laughs> That's a teach. All right, so Paul's very honest with him. Uh, verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Again, 
but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And a little discussion question. I guess I put the answer up there, but anyway, my bad. What made Paul a good missionary and a good pastor? What made Paul a good missionary and a good pastor? What do you think? He focused on one thing. He preached Jesus Christ. Yep, absolutely. Uh, not distracted. Not distracted by, by anything else. Uh, that's the message. That, that's the one unique message that the church has uh, to share with the world. Uh, that is the light. I mean, that's the only light uh, in our world. We are friends from, from Teen Challenge. Uh, whatever uh, we go through, suffer, sickness, or addiction, uh, uh, that the darkness of this world tries to smother us with. Uh, the light, the only light, is Jesus Christ. And we are so blessed to see that light and to have that light. And it is a, a tremendous responsibility that we have to shine that light out into our world. All right. Now, verse 6 uh, to the end, we kind of get into the... Uh, oh, wait, hold on. How is an emphasis on human wisdom adversely affecting uh, many Christian churches in our country? How is the emphasis on human wisdom, worldly wisdom, how is that adversely affecting so many Christian churches in our country? They lost sight of Christ, the, the foundation, the light, the, the one main message, and have gotten so caught up in many other worldly concerns and worldly uh, emphases, right? There are social issues, there are life issues, there are uh, sex, gender issues, uh, that worldly wisdom says... Uh, one thing, uh, but God's word says something else very clearly, and it is. Uh, it's sad when we see other churches uh, getting distracted uh, away from, from the true message of God's word. Uh, we do, however, let's get on to, oh, I got another one for you. No, yeah, no, I think y'all talked about that last week. All right, all right, verse six. Uh, next section here, we're talking about God's wisdom that's revealed by the Holy Spirit, obviously versus the worldly wisdom that we uh, seek and discover uh, on our own. Verse 6, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Remember, so he starts off on this wisdom topic. He starts off saying, look, I don't, I don't need to know any of this. I didn't come to proclaim anything. I didn't claim to know any kind of philosophy or math or whatever. I just claim to know Jesus Christ, him crucified for you. But then he does say, now we, we do speak of great wisdom. Now this wisdom that we are speaking is greater than the wisdom of the world. The wisdom that you are familiar with or that you're, you're seeking after. Um, the wisdom that the world is uh, seeking after, what does it say? Um, the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing? Great question. So what does that mean that they're coming to nothing? One of the biggest problems uh, atheists have, and we have modern atheists, obviously, Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins. and um, Anyway, uh, one of the biggest problems they, 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 can't, they can't resolve is that if there is no God, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose? Well, we're going to love our kids and, and take care of our family. Well, they're just going to die. They're going to come to nothing. Well, they're going to have grandkids, and then they're going to come to nothing. You could say, I don't know if it's 10 million or 100 million. Don't quote me on it. But whatever it is, hundred millions and millions of years from now, our sun is going to continue to expand to a red giant and evaporate the earth. I mean, it's all coming to nothing. 
If this is all there is, yeah, you can seek to know it all. You can seek to rule over it all. But if there is no God, what does it really matter? Nothing matters. That's why Paul would say in another place, uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? If, if you have no faith, if you have no God, just pleasure yourself. There's really not even a reason to love your spouse or your kids. There's no moral code. If there's not a lawgiver, we all do what we want. It all comes to nothing. Uh, it all goes to chaos. And that, going back to the whole creation, the origin of life thing, uh, that actually aligns with the laws of physics. Um, that all things are losing energy, all things are becoming more chaotic, all things are winding down. Uh, well, it's the opposite of what would have to happen. That's the law of, third law of thermodynamics, right? Everything is breaking down. All energy is being depleted. Well, it's the opposite that you would need in order to create life, in order to grow. It would have to be expanding. It would be increasing. In energy. It, you had to go from chaos to order, not from order to chaos, which is what we see in the physical world. So, uh, so you can seek after all this wisdom. And uh, again, hey, I went to school. There's, wisdom of the world is great to know. Uh, reason is a gift of God. Okay, but all this is limited when it comes to our, our faith and our knowing, our relationship with our God. Because all of this is coming to nothing. Verse 7, no, we declare uh, God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. So again, we are Paul's saying, we are telling you a wisdom, but this is, this is so much greater than the world's wisdom. This is a mystery of God. This has been hidden. And think about, think about God's people in the Old Testament. Their faith in the Messiah who was to come. From Genesis 3, when God promised that his seed would, would uh, crush the head of the serpent's seed. And it would bite his heel. And all throughout, many, many prophecies of this Messiah, they call them in, in the Old Testament, the Savior, God's Savior. But think how, you know how hindsight's twenty twenty, right? We get to look back and we've actually seen Jesus. And, but think about what it was like for them to try to just even put a, get a handle on what, what was this great mystery, this great gift of salvation God is, is, is proclaiming to us. And yet, Paul is saying, now it has been revealed. Right? And Jesus Christ is the revelation of the Father. He reveals to us who the Father is, the nature of God, the love of God for all humanity, for the whole world. Okay, so since before time began, God had destined this, this wisdom of Christ for our own blessing. Verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. All right, just as a little uh, example, uh, Paul writes uh, to show how uh, unaware and lack, what lack of understanding, lack of wisdom, godly wisdom, uh, the people in the world had for his plan. So when God did send his son, as prophesied, again, hindsight's twenty twenty. I'm not, not bashing the people before... But, but we look back now and we can see hundreds of prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus Christ fulfilled. Boom, 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 boom. I love, one of my favorites is on uh, Monday, Thursday. If you come on Thursday night uh, of Holy Week uh, and the altar guild is stripping the altar and I read Psalm 22. Uh, my hands and feet were pierced. Right, My God, my God, why have you forsaken? All of these prophetic things written some 1,000 years before Jesus was born. Right? When we look back, we can see the magnificent plan of God, how he weaves all of human history uh, together to bring about his plan. Now, when you're living in it, and certainly when you're looking into the future, it's a little harder to put in. So you have to have faith. You have to have more faith. But this is what, uh, this is what Paul is saying. He's revealed this to us now. Now we see. Uh, verse 9, however, as it is written, 
What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I, I just love that verse so much. It's from Isaiah 64. Uh, Paul's quoting Isaiah 64, and he's applying it here to the gift of Jesus Christ, which gives us heaven, gives us eternal life through Jesus Christ. And I love to share this at uh, funerals as well, when we try to think about heaven, and they're in their better place, and uh, people have a, a lot of ideas or thoughts or guesses about uh, what it's like right now in heaven. I only have a few, very few uh, scripture verses uh, that, that uh, describe it, but here's one. It's something that we've never seen before or heard before. It's something so great we can't even conceive of it in our, in our human minds. It, Paul's saying, if you could see it, it would blow your mind. Literally, just blow your mind. That's how awesome this gift is of Jesus Christ, to be with him forever. All right, verse 10. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Uh, verse 10 uh, Luther's Catechism speaks of the natural knowledge of God and then the revealed knowledge of God. Natural knowledge is what we can learn by observation. Very much uh, common sense things, like you rub my back, I'll, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Just kind of relationship uh, dynamics. Worldly things, uh, or, or, or scientific things, things that we can observe, things that we can see, things that we can study, things that we can learn. We are learning about God. And again, that's another one of my soapbox issues. I won't get on it, but I'll just say the churches are, is who started the universities. Uh, the churches started public schools. Uh, and the worldview was that God, that theology is the queen of the sciences. It sat on top at the university. And whatever you studied, astronomy, mathematics, uh, uh, education, teaching, language, literature, arts, you were discovering, right, what God has created. You, you, were, you weren't inventing anything, right? you weren't creating anything new, right, you're discovering, oh, there's a planet outside of the soul, oh, there's a actual protons and neutrons inside, you didn't create those things, right, you're discovering God's creation, and that was the worldview. But there's also revealed knowledge of God, and that knowledge can only be uh, granted to us by the Holy Spirit. Right? So one of the natural knowledges, when it comes to spiritual realm, is that we're sinners. That's natural knowledge. Uh, you can go to any culture, anywhere in the world, at any time in history, there's two things they believe in. They believe there's a God, and that they've made him mad. They have, whether they're trying to sacrifice their virgins in the volcano or whether they're trying, to, they're trying to appease this God that they have offended. We all are born with this knowledge. It's just natural knowledge. But the revealed knowledge from the Holy Spirit is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And that's the light, again, that the church today is charged with sharing. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Uh, verse 11, for, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. I don't know if I put that on here, but uh, no, that's okay. But, uh, so Paul, what Paul's saying here is like, who knows your thoughts except your own spirit? All right? And then unless you tell someone. Well, who knows God's thoughts except the Spirit of God until he tells us, right? Uh, and so that's what he's saying. The Spirit of God is the one who reveals the nature of God, the love of God, the gospel. It's just natural how that works. Uh, verse 12, for um, what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God freely gives us. Again, it's not something that we can understand on our own. We need the Holy Spirit to give us this gift of faith. This is what we speak, Paul and his, and his uh, missionaries. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, 
explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words, right? In interpreting spiritual truths um, to those who are spiritual. In other words, it's taught by the Holy Spirit, and it, we, are, we receive it through the Holy Spirit, right? Without the Holy Spirit, we can't comprehend that revealed knowledge, that mystery of God's plan of salvation. Um, okay, obviously, yep, the Bible's inspired. Every word uh, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's, why we're, that's why we all have our Bibles at home, our Bibles in our pews, uh, and we have Bible studies here uh, throughout the week at, at our church. Uh, God's wisdom is revealed through his word. Um, I'm just going to finish up. It only goes to 16. Let's see. Verse 14, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. 15, the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For, and then here he's going to quote Isaiah again, the prophet in the Old Testament, who has known the mind of the Lord? As to instruct him. That's like a rhetorical question. It's like, it's foolish. Uh, who are we to tell God what's right, what's wrong? Uh, but we have the mind of Christ. Right? The mind of uh, his obedient son. The mind of his humble son who only seeks to know God and to make him known. Well, uh, just a couple of discussion questions, I guess, as we kind of look at the sections here in this last part of the chapter. Uh, so Paul had just downplayed wisdom, remember? But now he says that he does use wisdom. So what's the wisdom that Paul teaches? Spiritual, Spiritual wisdom. Yeah. Uh, the truth in God's word uh, revealed by the Holy Spirit, received through the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you look at verse 8, uh, which rulers do you suppose Paul had in mind? Verse 8. What does he say? None of the rulers that they understood it, if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Caiaphas, Pilate, Herod. Yeah. Pharisees, on and on. Yes. Sadducees, all of them. Um, they, uh, they, the rulers of this age uh, did not understand, did not understand, and they had John the Baptist, prepare, well, they had the whole Old Testament, all the prophets uh, proclaiming. They had John the Baptist proclaiming, preparing the way of the Lord. They had Jesus Christ in his own testimony, his own teaching, and his miracles as testimonies. But they would not, they would not understand it. There is something to uh, the role of being stubborn and having a hard heart. Uh, if you think of the story of uh, the, Egypt, uh, the Israelites uh, leaving Egypt, how many times did it say Pharaoh had a hard heart? Right? He just flat out refused to listen to the words of Moses. He flat out refused to accept the signs, the miracles that God was doing in his land through Moses as a testimony to Moses' words and warnings about letting his people go. But his heart was so hard, it would not receive. That's what we... Correct. So, yes, she, she uh, asked or commented that um, one of the reasons they did not or did not want to accept was for their own position, their own, uh, whatever it's, uh, power or, or pride, prestige, the rulers, uh, the, these were the people, uh, these, yeah, these were the people that the people come to. Uh, they need something. They have a question. You help me with this. They got all, all the answers. Uh, and, yeah, Jesus was a very threat, a real threat to their position.
Right, Nicodemus, yeah. Yeah, Nicodemus accepted him. And he came at night, so no one else would see him. <laughs> John chapter 3, yeah. That's always interesting. At night, he came to Jesus. Um, so, yeah, Paul's had direct people in mind, but obviously anybody. Uh, if you leave verse 10, through whom does God reveal his wisdom to us? Yep, his spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit work today? What are the ways that God sends his Holy Spirit to us? Let me change the word ways to means, because it, it's the same thing, same definition. What are the means of grace? What are the ways that the Holy Spirit is delivered to us? Hmm? Yes, it is in the catechism, the means of grace. His word and his sacraments, specifically baptism and the Lord's Supper. Right? Can God do other things? Can God work in other ways? Of course he can. He can do anything he wants. But what we know is in Scripture, he promises to work through the means of his word proclaimed and his sacraments administered. That's a whole other blessing that we have, that we get to experience these things in physical ways. So it's not just a tingly, wingly feeling that we have. Oh, I got the Spirit, and oh, I feel sad today. Maybe I don't have the Spirit today. No. We can look back and say, I know on November 10th, 19th, I was baptized, and God doesn't mess up. God gave me his spirit. It's done. God did it. I can't mess it up, and God doesn't mess up. I know last week when we walked up to this altar and we received the body and blood of Christ, we received the Holy Spirit to strengthen our faith, to forgive our sins, and assure us of the gift of eternal life. It happened. It was real. I smelled it, I tasted it, I touched it, right? It's not some whimsical feeling or some philosophical thought that we attain. It's real, it's concrete. What a, that's so cool that our God does that for us. How assuring is that? If you look at verse 11, why can God's thoughts only be revealed by God's spirit? We've talked about that, just as, it's just common sense. Uh, you can't know my thoughts unless I tell you those thoughts. Uh, the natural person, I'm going to get to the big questions. All right, here we go. How does the truth, verse 14, explain the unbelief and spiritual poverty in our world today? Verse 14. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. that explain some of the spiritual poverty that we see in our world? And again, uh, Jesus Christ, let's just say salvation, forgiveness, the whole package, right, is a gift of grace. Right? It's a gift. God gives it to us. And as long as we don't reject that gift, right, it's ours. It's already been paid for. It's already been delivered to us. But, yeah. Yes. They can reject the gift. Now, I will say, by and large, you know, my experience, I've talked to uh, students, I've talked to, obviously, uh, men and women and law enforcement who see terrible things in our world and have to react and respond to traumatic things. They see, see things, thank God, that, so we don't have to uh, deal with them. Uh, but it does affect their worldview. And they can become very cynical. Now, I will say uh, there's a big difference between uh, people who have doubts, people who have questions, people who are trying to wrap their mind around something that just seems too good to be true, it seems to be too big to, to, to comprehend or to deal with. 
uh, versus, I think, the very, very few people who are legitimately opposed to God, reject God's gift, mock God. Um, I think there's, I think there's a big difference there. There's, there's a, a group again that had that hard heart. They've hardened their heart. They're stubbornly rejecting the evidence, God's word, their friends, versus the people who are struggling to believe. Somebody today walking out of church told me about their uh, person in their life who uh, is not a believer at the moment because he feels like he's not worthy enough. That's the whole point. We're all not worthy enough. You're there. You made it. Yeah, you're worthy because you feel like you're not worthy. Whatever. So there's just there's all kinds of struggles. There's all kinds of reactions to things in the world. God knows the heart. And uh, um, if they're still breathing, there's still hope. And I've seen many deathbed confessions. I've seen many, not like I murdered somebody, faith, confessions of faith. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. I've seen many people on their deathbed uh, had the life scared out of them, right? It's kind of like, all right, well, it was all fun and games while, you know, I was going on vacations and raising kids and working, but I'm about to meet my maker. Uh, something, something jolts you. Yeah, well, it's still, you know, there's no atheists in a foxhole. Absolutely. And that's just as uh, salvific as uh, the baby who was baptized, you know, 92 years earlier. Uh, it's the Jesus' parable of the workers in the vineyard. Come, some came and worked in the morning. Some came to work in the afternoon. Some, some, some came to work like one hour before quitting time. And they all got paid the same. Right? So we may have gotten more work done. Uh, through our life, and I think there is actually scriptural evidence that says there's some types of rewards in heaven, like the, the jewels in our crown, whatever that is supposed to end up being. Um, but as far as salvation goes, whew, actually, uh, Paul even, I think maybe we'll get to it, Paul even talks about some of those who make it into heaven with their eyebrows singed. In other words, like, they just barely got across the line before the door closed, <laughs> right? Um, but it's, praise God, right? And so we pray for them. That's why we always try to, we always try to act and speak in love. Uh, we don't want to push anybody away. We don't want to, you know, increase their stubbornness uh, if we can. Um, all right, well, let me leave you with, uh, with this last thought. The Holy Spirit provides the only real wisdom in this world when he reveals saving knowledge about Christ through the Bible. Right? This is the foundation of our church, of our faith, uh, sort of our congregation as well. Uh, seek to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for, your Lord, for this day, for the Lord's day. Thank you for letting us to gather together around your word. And we thank you for the freedoms that uh, our veterans have fought to defend so that we can gather and worship in public freely and exercise our faith in you and share our faith freely uh, with our loved ones, with our neighbors and friends, Lord. Uh, all the people who are in our lives, all the people that you bring into our paths uh, this week, I uh, pray you help us to have a, uh, a, a spiritual ear uh, open, listening uh, to their hearts uh, to see uh, where they place their trust in, what wisdom are they seeking. And give us that opportunity, give us those words, uh, Lord, to share with them uh, what you've done in our own lives and the testimony that we have. Uh, the blessings and the peace uh, that we have, uh, knowing you, knowing your son, Jesus Christ, uh, knowing we are forgiven, knowing that while uh, these, uh, the elements uh, that make up our bones and our skin cells and our blood cells and organs are, uh, may turn to dust, we'll, we'll return to, to nothing, uh, that our soul is eternal and you have redeemed it and uh, we will live with you in paradise forever. But no eye has seen or ear heard nor beyond anything we can imagine. Uh, we look forward to that day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for being here.